be such a chicken? I'm not a chicken, Melanie. I just don't want to get hooked. Nobody wants to get hooked. I mean, I don't want to become an addict and live in horrible poverty with rats and lice and everything. I just want to try drugs once. I'm Garth Mullins. This is Crackdown. Episode 4, Blame. I remember back a few years ago, my friend Nick had just died of overdose. I'm at his funeral, half the seats are empty. It's subdued, a little awkward. Someone tells a story about him, about when they were kids, having an argument that seems trivial now. It lightens the mood and there are a few polite chuckles, but they trail off quickly. And there's another feeling too, a sort of blame simmering in the chapel. A couple of weeks before, Nick's girlfriend woke up to find his cold body in bed beside her, overdosed. Nick and his girlfriend lived in a college town suburb, and there's a lot of drug users out that way. Nick was in his late 20s, and just before he died, he was starting a career in IT. He wore a tie to work. Now, here he is, up front in a coffin, also wearing a tie, hair pulled back and in his best clothes. I remember seeing a woman just radiate waves of grief and anger. I remember thinking, is that his mom? I'd never met her. But I can tell she blames us. Nick's junky friends. And his girlfriend too. Who'd never be the same, carrying that misplaced guilt until she herself died. Being at the memorial, I felt like I was somehow making things worse. The dope in my system insulting his memory, and everyone could see it. I wasn't there the night Nick died. I didn't even live in the same town anymore. But I was somehow implicated. We both used heroin, and Nick's mom knew it. That could have been my mother, trying to keep control of herself in the front pew. And that could have been my body up there in the coffin set out in my high school graduation suit jacket. I had to get out of there, so I made up some excuse that nobody bought. I skipped the wake and scored a flap of what had killed Nick. I tried to put that day out of my mind and move on, but I'd think of it sometimes. Like one day when I was just watching the news, another crying mother, her kid gone, Overdose or murder or drunk driving, I can't remember now. And then some suit, reaching in from out of frame, puts his awkward arm around her shoulders. He's a politician, there to announce some new law, more jails or extra police or harsher sentences. He's gonna get tough on crime. He's gonna lock him up and throw away the key. He's gonna name the law after the dead kid. I turn off the TV, I cook up the heroin, and alone, I fire at home. We're on a cul-de-sac in a suburb of Edmonton, in Alberta, Canada. It's a two-story house with bay windows, and a two-car garage facing the street. Other lawns in the neighborhood are littered with scooters and bikes, toys belonging to kids who are probably in bed by now. On this lawn, there's an election sign for the local conservative candidate and a for sale sign. This is where the Widdock family lives. So just walking up to the front door now. That's Emily Rendell Watson, an Edmonton freelancer. We asked her to pack up her mic and go to the Widdock's home. Hi, hello. Hi, how are 
are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, I'm Emily. Hi, Emily. My name is Miura. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. And that's our dog, Tassie. Hi. <laughs> She's always welcoming everyone that comes in the house. She's my son's dog. We, we got her when she was eight weeks old. Uh, my son was six years old and that's what he wanted for his birthday, a uh, little puppy. Aww. So, um, so she picked him. We went and uh, to, you know, oh, 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 <laughs> she's just peeing. <laughs> Come on, Tassie. Come on. Come on, you bad girl. Come on, you bad girl. After showing Emily around the house, Miora and Steve give me a call. Can you hear us, Garth? Okay. I'm a little nervous to talk with them. This episode is about who we should blame for the overdose crisis. And I know they have different views than me. I wonder if they feel nervous too. We start with small talk. Miora tells me she's a nurse. Steve is a manager at an industrial construction company. They tell me they built their home back in 2004. At that time, their son Callum was seven years old. And, uh, my husband and my son and, and the neighbors around with their kids and their parents, they used to play street hockey uh, in the summertime till midnight. So does that make you a hockey mom? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always, I always like, love to watch my son uh, play hockey. And uh, I thought, you know, I would never scream in the arena or anything like that. Trust me, I did. I always yelled and scream. And, and I was a really, a, a real, real hockey mom. He, he was known to be a hard hitter. He had uh, literally flattened a couple of the top draft picks at Bantam level. So he, um, the scouts were always looking for him type of thing. But uh, unfortunately, uh, he, he had some friends, so-called friends, I would say, that convinced them that, you know, hockey was lame and they didn't play. And they they were wanting to smoke weed and party all the time. And, uh, you know... Steve tells me that eventually Callum started using more than pot. One night, Callum's having a smoke on the back porch. He's 17. It's midnight. Muir's in the kitchen clearing up. So uh, then he came in the house and he said, uh, Mom, I'm going to go to sleep. You know, uh, he gave me a hug and he told me, um, love you. And he was always uh, very hugging, like he, we were always open and ready for a hug. Muir finishes the washing up. She sits down on the couch and falls asleep for a while. She wakes up an hour later, heads to the master bedroom upstairs, and she sees a light coming out from under Callum's bedroom door. I thought maybe the TV's on, maybe he fell asleep, you know, with the TV on. So I knocked in the door and no one was answering, so I just opened it. And um, so when I got in, I knew that something was wrong because I could see my son lying down like lifeless on the bed so I started screaming you know uh, his name and uh, and shaking him and then my my husband heard me my wife had found him and and screamed and I went running in and started giving him CPR and everything his airway wasn't opening up very easily but I cleared the passageway and, and kept going I was I was so distraught and I was so upset and and he was telling me to call 911 and, and I'm a registered nurse but I I kind of lost it you know Paramedics arrive. Steve's been giving Callum CPR for 15 minutes. They take over. They send Miora and Steve out of the room while they work. I was praying to God to take me in and save him. And finally someone came out. It was like hours, you know, that's how it felt. You know, someone came out and, and they told us they found he has a pulse. It's shallow, but he has a pulse. Uh, he got some street Xanax off one of his so-called friends and uh, overdosed on the fentanyl. So that was uh, June 27th, uh, 2016. Um, in fact, my birthday. And uh, yeah, not something that uh, I'll ever forget. That was Callum's first overdose. Did you have naloxone? Did they send you home with uh, no, naloxone? Uh, n n no, not the first time. They didn't send us at home with anything, but because they told us that they did a naloxone um, uh, injection. Uh, after, you know, he uh, was out of the hospital, I went to the pharmacy and I requested one. 
So after that, I always carried one with me. Right. It was coming with me all the time. Uh, I had one in my car, one in my purse, one in my pocket. My husband had one in his car. Stephen Miora sent Callum to treatment. He overdosed again and another time. They called the cops. Callum was arrested and forced by the courts to move out. Then one night, Miora was parked outside of Callum's apartment. So I walked to my car and I was just messaging my husband when I saw the a police car coming and stopping in front of the building. Then one of the, po one of the cops, you know, just run into the building. At that moment, I knew that something was wrong. So when I saw that, I just got out of the car and run after him. I didn't, I don't even know if I locked my car or not. I have no idea, but I was right behind him. Uh, so I saw my son lying lifeless in bed, in his bed there in, in that apartment. And, and I started, uh, I started telling the policeman, you know, I, I need to do his, his naloxone. I have one in my pocket. And I said, please, could you move away so I can do that? And he says, he turned around and he says, who are you? Where did you came from? And I said, you know, I was in a parking lot, a lot. I just followed you. And he was, he started to push me out of the, the apartment. And I said, please let me do his, his naloxone. I know he's, he overdosed. Let me do it. But he wouldn't let me. So finally, uh, the... Miura, do, do you yeah. think that would have made it? That would have made the difference if if you. I have you. no idea. I'm I'm going to I'm going to always live with that thinking. You know, what if he was still alive? Five minutes later, he was dead. He didn't have a chance anymore. I would. I'm gonna always always going to live with that and never ever forgive that 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 officer. We reached out to the Edmonton Police Service for comment on how they responded to Callum's overdose. They declined to comment. Mira, who? Who do you and Steve sort of hold responsible for this? Who do you guys blame? Uh, we blame his so-called friends. The girl then was there and, um, and I saw her bring in a bottle. Um, and I think, you know, um, she brought the drink called Lynn. And I got so mad at her, I swore at her. And I told her I'm, that, you know, you killed my son. You know, the people who, who wound up providing the carfentanil. Uh, or, yeah, his so-called so best friend. Right. And what do you guys think should happen to people who have, you know, supplied someone like Callum with fentanyl or carfentanil uh, or drugs with that in it? So that guy should uh, be in jail for attempted manslaughter. Um, he should be in jail, in jail for dealing. But the police, sorry, the law enforcement, <laughs> they they did not process the scene as a sudden death investigation. And we definitely have become so familiar with that in BC. You know, we're finding the fentanyl in like 80% of what's sold as, as heroin now. And just, uh, you know, we make this little radio show here. And uh, one of our, one of the people we make it with on the team uh, just died last month. And, um, you know, I really... I've known her for a long time. I felt very close to her. And uh, I felt that sort of hot sort of anger at, at, the, at the causes of, of, uh, of what happened to her. Um, and so I, you know, I sort of feel this um, sense of empathy with your loss. And I think we, you know, like the police didn't also investigate what happened to Cherise. You know, we, we sort of felt like, there should be more. And, um, you know, I, I kind of think what could have made a difference for her. And, and maybe you, maybe you think that too. Oh, oh, we know it. Mandatory treatment. Mandatory treatment. Yeah. We don't necessarily support the legalization of, uh, hard drugs. We did not support the legalization of marijuana. In fact, that, uh, uh knowing uh, how, how it damages the youth. So we look at the Portugal model uh, or program and, and how they apply that. Uh, you know that the police bring the individual in for to a counselor. The counselor looks at the past history, what they say the offense was, uh, personal possession, overdose, that type of thing. Would would uh, you know still get them a sentence, but it would be a mandatory treatment sentence, not an incarceration criminal sentence so uh, um the the you know the legalization uh, and uh, clean supply given to users no I, I don't think that 
helps get them off of it. Uh, I think that, you know, that's just taxpayers paying more to, to support uh, people that are in the need. But uh, the Portugal model can be played out here. So do you think, do you think mandatory treatment would have worked for, for Callum? Yes. Yeah. Right. His mind was not clear. He could not make a decision on his own if he if he was going to go for treatment, how long, uh, if he needed to go for treatment. So I think, you know, a mandatory w would have cleared his head up. And probably in about two or three weeks, you know, he would have said, you know, what am I doing with my life? I, I know my son would have said that. I am in favor of, you know, uh, safe injection sites. I, I think possibly too much of the, the money, the budget, was directed towards that versus the percentage of people dying at home, uh, dying alone. Uh, we're talking about kids that are coming from well-to-do families. So the safe injection sites, yes, are picking up the, the people that are a little harder down on their luck, but yet we're seeing again and again, people dying at home. Uh, I, I, I agree with you, with you know, others. that's, that's really happened a lot here. It's happened to some people I know too, because yeah. you're right. The safe injection sites are they they work for some people. I kind of yeah. feel like we need a lot of different things. For me, I think maybe safe injection sites are part of it. I do think we need a safer drug supply so that because people will end up using sometimes. I don't want to see them die. I, I don't. I don't think that illegal drugs being sold by drug dealers and we don't know what's in them is a very good situation. So I would prefer to see some kind of regulated uh, drug supply that, that people can access. But I, I feel like that where I'm starting from, just the, the, the anger and the, and the loss I feel for um, that, you know, the people that I've come up with that I, that I love and care about that have been taken by this, I, I, I feel like we might share some of that and, and maybe not some of the solutions that we might look for. This is my personal belief is that arresting drug dealers at the bottom is 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 not going to do it but getting a safer supply in at the top might i gotta be honest with you uh, my feeling is these are now serial killers we're not talking about manslaughter anymore this is murder whether it's murder one murder two they have now become serial killers you look at them letting them out on bail to continue to deal, to pay for their high-priced lawyers, and more are dying. So the, the end of it is they have to set some examples. And if that starts at the bottom and works its ways up, the harder the charge they give, the more apt the, uh, the prosecuted person is to turn over their supplier. And so some people to, like uh, like Donald Trump have been suggesting maybe they need to bring back capital punishment for that. What do you guys think about mm -hmm. that? Uh, well, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm a firm believer in, in capital punishment. Uh, I have been all my life. If you don't set some examples at the lower mark, people aren't afraid. They're, they're, they're not afraid. They know that they're only going to get three years, and of that, they might serve a year. And that that's injustice yeah no i i just want to say one other thing and i'll let the everybody else say goodbye i ju just one second because i just can catch that i can hear that through the microphone the dog barking? Yeah, I do. it's very, it can pick up a lot. Okay, why don't, yeah, I can hear that through the mic, Go so we're just going to have to, just hold on one second. <laughs> Sorry about that. He's getting kicked out of the room. <laughs> oh, poor guy. What's his name? What's the dog's name? It's Tassie. She's a female. Calm had picked her out and named her. It was his dog, and she's got a very bad separation anxiety. She looks for him at the door. She looks for him everywhere in his room and and won't uh, leave us alone now. That she follows us uh, everywhere. But uh, what, what what kind of what kind of dog is it? It's a Jack Russell. Right. <laughs> And is she the one who had the little accident at the beginning of our uh, our night? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
That was the hardest interview I've done for Crackdown so far. I empathize with the Woodhucks, but I disagree. They want mandatory treatment, but in my experience, it doesn't work. You have to want that treatment for it to stand a chance of sticking. And as for harsh sentencing, treating fatal overdoses like murders does not stop the dying. In fact, it makes things worse. Fentanyl and carfentanyl are just the most recent arrivals after a century of increasingly strong drugs. As law enforcement gets harsher, illegal drugs get more potent. It's the iron law of prohibition. But the law and order perspective is gaining traction. The Widocks had a United Conservative Party sign on their lawn. That party just won a majority government in Alberta. They want mandatory minimum sentences for drug dealers and no new supervised consumption sites. Across North America, friends, partners, and low-level dealers are locked up for selling, sharing, or delivering drugs that led to a fatal overdose. Some drug users are now carrying Do Not Prosecute notes. A template was created by the Urban Survivors Union, a U.S. drug user group. After my conversation with the Woodocks, I'm thinking about carrying one too. It'd go like this. I, Garth Mullins, request prosecutorial restraint as herein described. I understand do not prosecute means that if I die as a result of an accidental drug overdose, I request that no one be charged, prosecuted, or held criminally responsible for my death. I understand this decision is being made to challenge the oppressive and often perpetuated false dichotomy between people who use drugs and the people who sell drugs. We are, more often than not, one in the same. Mother found her unconscious in her room. She, I did CPR on her until the paramedics got there and they had to pull me off of her. Jessica says she knows who sold her daughter that last hit and has told police. They don't seem too interested in pursuing anything. So here this mother sits with overwhelming grief. It'll never be the same. Wondering who the next mother like her will be and if there's anything she can do to stop it. Are being charged with reckless homicide and the victim's father says it's about time. We just wanted justice from the start. Sandy bragged that heroin he sold killed 15 people. Somebody that's going to claim that they're that wonderful that they've killed that many people, maybe he should be injected with all his fentanyl and see what happens to him. The truth is, there's been times in my life when I felt really alienated around parents whose kids have died of OD. It sounds terrible to say that, but it seemed like they were always blaming us. It got to the point where I started to think that this kind of loss like, naturally made you conservative. I thought that for years, until I met Petra. Well, we are at the steps of the BC legislature on a gloriously sunny day. And we are setting up for our rally to decriminalize substance use, possession. And um, we, have, we have people from all over the country here, a lot from BC. Petra Schultz is a university instructor. Like the Widdocks, she's from Edmonton. And she's also lost a child. But somehow she came to a completely different place. She helped start a group called Moms Stop the Harm. And they want many of the same things that I want, a safe supply, more harm reduction, and an end to the war on drugs. Today, we are working on just one ask. We've got a lot more on our clipboards. We want to decriminalize the possession and use of illicitly obtained drugs for personal use. We want to end the war on drugs which is a war on the people we love. Yeah. Yeah. Last fall, Mom Stop the Harm sent hundreds of photos of people we lost to the Prime Minister, asking, do something, Prime Minister. And what did we hear back? Nothing. Nothing. Silence, silence. But Don stood up in the house and he- After the rally, Petra gets in her car with one of the moms. Her name is Samantha. She's been crying the whole rally and it becomes really clear that this is a big part of helping lead this kind of group. Just being there for people at their lowest point. I 
haven't been able to give up their ashes. Yeah. yeah. To bury them. Yeah. Her sister wanted to scatter them, and I said no for when she's old. Yeah. Like she was a tortured soul. Yeah, we, it took us a few months, and in the end, we scattered some of our son's ashes on a place that he loved on a mountain. Mm -hmm. And we also um, um, have some in a, in a churchyard in, in a, on the island here on the Gulf Islands. Oh yes, yeah. So it's I like I like having a place that I can go to. You know, not that the. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I, I you know, totally it's, get that, Petra. Yeah, it's ashes. Do you um, know? It's not the first, but still, it's a place where you can go. It's a physical and, and, place to commemorate that. Yeah, exactly. It's a, a, a place dedicated to him and, where I can go. And, and but, you know what, darling? I, I, I feel like to her children mm. may need that physical place oh, to yeah. go. Oh, yeah. Exactly. To acknowledge their mom or feel yeah. close to her or whatever. Yeah. And if they want to ever, like, you know. Yeah. It's hard to come to terms with and, and you know, it's something really... Um, I read in a grief book um, where the author proposed that what one could seek is reconciliation. I like that term. It reminds me of truth and reconciliation. So reconciling doesn't mean that you forget it happened. It doesn't mean that you say it's okay. It doesn't mean that you'll ever forget, but it means you can you can learn to live with the fact and um, and make it part of your life, kind of make it make a new life. I had a friend once tell me, "You're not the same anymore." <laughs> I had to I had to shake my head. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's okay. Sorry, Samantha. It's all right. Those are all things that I need to hear. I need to know that there's something after this. Yeah, there is. There is, and you know, and I wish I could tell you that the pain will go away, but I don't want to lie to you. Um, it's it's always there. But what I find now, it's been four years, and I'm fortunate. I get to talk about Danny a lot because of the advocacy, and that helps. And I find the pain is less acute. It's less sharp. It's it's so there. Right now. Yeah. Now the early months, you know, the the really the first two years are. Um, yeah, I don't know how. Could you tell me the story about how you got here and who was Danny and what happened there? Yeah, yeah. Danny was um, our youngest child. Um, he he was kind of different from his siblings, and they always you know, had a really easy time in school. He didn't. He was very sensitive, very emotional kind of kid. When he's, he was three, what he wanted for a present was a cactus. And early on, he had an interest in cooking. And he learned from his grandma how to make German apple strudel. He started um, working in a restaurant, just washing dishes. And like so many people do, you know, they wash dishes, soon they chop vegetables, soon they do other things. And he developed a real passion and um, he decided to go to culinary school. Now we are switching gears from the beer to the food. We have Denny Scholes here. And Denny, you are the head chef here at the Yellow. Uh, no, I'm the chef for our little restaurant okay. that we call Verse Lunch. So we have eight different types of bratwurst, and we we'll make them all in house. Can you say that with the accent? Bratwurst. Bratwurst. Very <laughs> nice. Very nice. And we are going to start the show. This is Danny on local TV. A guy in his early twenties, a little bemused at the energy of the host. She never stops smiling and nodding. His efficient chef's movements contrast with her big hand gestures. Danny's playing along, but he's not loving it. Yes, salt. A little bit of salt as well. Yeah. And then what's in this bucket? Uh, these are pig uh, intestines. <laughs> pig intestines. Can yeah. I grab one? Yeah, sure. Okay, ooh, that's cold. All right, this is a first. That's yeah. slimy and disgusting. So I soak those overnight, yeah, because they come salted. <laughs> they come salted, there yeah. you go. And ooh, lots of fresh lots herbs. Lots of meat on the show today. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely have you on the meat at the yellow There you go. How's that feel? All right, we're going to go wash up, then we're going to grind some meat and make potato salad later in the All show. All of our children uh, at some point have had some challenges with, uh, with anxiety or depression. And Danny did as well, but Danny didn't really want to acknowledge 
manage it. Um, he thought he was just um, doing doing okay. And um, unbeknownst to us, he started self-medicating um, in his late teens, Percocets, Oxy, whatever pain medication he could get on the street. Danny was 25 and just returning from a trip to the West Coast. Um, I saw him in the evening, picked him up from the airport, and I had cleaned up his apartment. He was a bit messy, and I'd gotten him a new bookshelf um, where he, I'd put his cookbooks in. And he said, wow, I need more cookbooks. That shelf so empty. And he was really happy, and he hugged me, and he said, I love you. And I said, love you, Danny. And those were the last words we spoke. My husband and I, we went over to his apartment and I knew the key code to get in the building. So I walked in the apartment and everything looked like Danny should be home. The radio was playing and there was a beer unopened and I couldn't find him. And just as I was walking out, I saw a light shining under the bathroom door and and it was all quiet in there. And I said his name, I said Danny, and there was not a sound. And you know, when you have a child who's using opioids, you always, you imagine, you know, oh, one day somebody will find him. Uh, you know, one day, this day that you dread and hope will never come, one day it might. And I was standing outside the door and hesitated for a moment. And I thought, yeah, here it is that day that I've been dreading. And I opened up and and there he was and and uh, laying on the bathroom floor. He must have just gone, gone down really, really quickly. The way he was laying there and I was fourth floor, I ran down four, four floors. And there was a phone number found in his bathroom and um, a friend looked at it who helped us clean the bathroom. She said, what do you want to do with this? And I just, I, I can't remember if I burned it or shredded it or something. When you found the number that you, that you thought might be uh, Danny's dealer, um, and and you wound up destroying it. What were what were the thought processes? What were you feeling when that was happening? It won't bring him back. That is really what I was thinking. It it won't bring him back. You mean like keeping the number and sending the police after or something? Yeah, yeah. It won't bring him back. And for me, it's just not where I wanted to go. I I wanted to honor Danny and and his life and the life that he lived. And that phone number wouldn't have made a difference. Last time I was in Edmonton, Petra took me to see Danny's old apartment building. Even while telling me some of her favorite memories from him, she still made sure that I got something to eat, a grilled cheese and coffee. And it occurs to me that sometimes with these moms, there are these little moments like this. They're looking out for me, subtly protective, maybe because it's something they can no longer do for the kids that they lost. Moms like Petra really aren't so different from my mom. I could see her among them. You know, I, I, I got to admit something here. Um, before you and me got to know each other a little bit, I sort of, I, I think I was, I think I had a, a strange perspective about um, the loved ones of of people who'd gone. I, I I've I lost so many people. Probably half the people I came up with are gone, and no one wants to hear from drug users for the most part, you know. But but politicians and the media seem to have this this space. And I, you know, I kept seeing these photo ops of politicians and crying moms on TV. And, and they were usually in that narrative of calling for tough love. And, at, you know, amongst drug user activists, we just felt like there was this privileging of one kind of grief over our experience. And that grief was being kind of harnessed to a lock them up narrative. But it, it was kind of knocking me back. It was, it was preventing me from connecting with people like you, I think a little bit. And, and the way you've come at this, like I understand it so much better now. And I, I understand the, the politics of it and I understand our common cause a lot better. And I, I wanna thank you for that because oh. I, I was just, I think it was offside, you know? 
Well, I'm, and I can I can understand how you'd you'd feel that way, and I'm I'm very you know we understand that um, we will not change this, and if we if we don't work together, and because of the stigma, people who use are not are not listened to. They don't have a space, and you know I was talking to um, a friend at McEwen University, and I said, look at us. I showed her a picture of the moms. I said we also so white, we also middle class, like what is going on here? And she said, you know, you use your privilege to your advantage and you use it for everyone. But really, uh, I think um, uh, people who use are re really don't have enough of a voice yet. You know, yeah. it's like when Oxy was reformulated, nobody asked Danny, what is that going to do to your use? Are you just going to quit because you can't get Oxy anymore? And if somebody had asked him or anybody else, they would have said, well, I'm going to whatever is available on the street. You know, so much bad drug policy is made without ever talking to anybody who's most affected by it. And that just needs to end. Yeah, we say nothing about us without yeah, us. Yeah, exactly. I'm seeing things differently now. When our movement has won things, like safe injection sites, is almost always because we built coalitions, which included people not like us who don't use drugs. That's how past struggles have won everything from better working conditions to civil rights to environmental reforms. Work's still in progress, but we've got to learn the strategy and tactics of previous social movements. A drug user rights movement must be led by drug users, but by ourselves, we don't have much economic or political power. Petra and Mom Stop the Harm show that parents can be important allies. But I can't help but wonder, is this just an edge case? I think it's a really interesting shift to see when you expect to hear that, that punitive law and order crack down, tougher enforcement. That's what you expect from bereaved parents. But I mean, the parents that I've met have such an amazing depth of insight into knowledge of harm reduction, decriminalization, and drug legalization approaches. I often say to them, you know, you have a PhD in drug policy. You've, you've earned it. This is Dr. Rebecca Hainsaw. She's an assistant professor at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. And this is a bit of an aside, but Rebecca was on the TV show Degrassi Junior High. If you're not familiar, the Degrassi franchise is that same Canadian cultural institution that gave Drake his start. Rebecca played one of the school's mean girls, Kathleen Mead. I don't know about drugs. Don't be such a chicken. I'm not a chicken, Melanie. I just don't want to get hooked. Nobody wants to get hooked. I mean, I don't want to become an addict and live in horrible poverty with rats and lice and everything. I just want to try drugs once. <laughs> I totally forgot. Yeah, so you're talking about the experiment, and that's way, way back, the first episode. So you can see this is when I was 13 in real life, so it's many years ago now. And um, Joey Jeremiah hears that we want to buy drugs. Joey F. Jeremiah, Esquire. F for pharmacy, at your service. Uh, so he makes up fake drugs to sell us because we're grade 7, and he sells us vitamin pills, but he tells us it's like New Zealand zappers. New Zealand zappers, the best. Five bucks, come on. And we take these vitamins and think we're high in grade seven. For sure. <laughs> mild. Very mild. <laughs> it's okay, Rebecca. Everyone gets bunked. Rebecca has interviewed dozens of moms whose kids have fatally overdosed. Moms who now advocate for better drug policy. She's a sociologist and a mother herself. And I'm a feminist and a gender researcher, so I was really looking at the construction of, you know, women's advocacy as parents and as mothers in the drugs policy space in Canada. And so how is the story of activism a family story and a, and a gender story? How did these parents get to that spot where they know all about this stuff and, and have really committed themselves to this? This is our producer, Alex. Rebecca's calling him from CJSW the campus radio station at the University of Calgary. I think it's a really interesting pathway that happens at different stages for different people because 
The experience of addiction in a family is so different, and also because the grief experience is different for people. So, um, for example, I interviewed a parent who, when I asked when their advocacy began, you know, she said it happened at the bedside, like it happened right after my son died. I knew I was going to advocate for uh, changes to the laws because um, he hadn't been served by this, and this is why we lost him. Um, and then in other instances, I think it's parents getting immersed in the space, being invited to meetings, finding a group online, and you know it begins to click for them. Uh, one parent shared with me during our interview, it was really just this sort of uh, emotional moment for both of us where she said, you know, ultimately my child just wanted to feel better. They wanted to feel better, Rebecca. We just want um, the people we love to be okay. Um, how much do you think um, class and race are part of this story? Well, I think it's a huge part, and I think it's sometimes an un unacknowledged tension in this space um, because there's voices we don't hear from. Um, indigenous parents and mothers haven't been highlighted in quite the same way. You know, this is a, a very tricky space, and I think it's really complicated, and I think uh, those privileges definitely play into um, how the media wants to tell the story. Um, but I know that many uh, parent activists are aware of this tension and use it strategically. So I, when we interviewed parents, you know, they were very uncomfortable. Um, many people in the interview spoke about the media trying to exploit them and just wanting the grief story, but they want to share the policy advocacy story. So I think, you know, like all activists, it's about being in this space where um, you're trying to strategically use the power and, and privilege that you might have uh, to advance a message. And then, of course, what you're getting at is recognizing that there are voices without privilege and there's voices that we need to hear from more. Do you think that um, the movement against the war on drugs is failing these these kinds of victims out in the suburbs, parents, um, young kids of the, of the drug war? Like, is there something that we should be doing that we aren't? I'm not so sure. I, I mean, I think I think we failed massively because we have a whole mythology of the trajectory into addiction and what the solutions are. Uh, so we have many middle class parents buying into, uh, you know, non-evidence-based treatment modalities like residential abstinence-based therapy. It's just not there. But I just want to add, like the I think the main struggle, is not actually parent shifting because there's many progressive people. I really feel from what I've done is the struggle is the people around you who haven't lived it. Even in progressive spaces, I still feel that there's this underlying attitude when you hear a parent share their story of what did they do wrong? You know, yeah. what didn't they do? Oh, is there divorce in their family? Was there conflict? Were they not supportive enough? You know, this really um, strong narrative of mother blame that we've had in the mental illness space and the substance use space, I think it's really hard for people to dislodge. So I think um, even though we can talk about anti-stigma, I feel that that really exists. Both Callum's parents and Danny's parents understand this truth. Someone is to blame for the death of their kids. This is not just a force of nature. I blame Nixon and Reagan and Trump, classic drug warriors. I blame the ministers and the bureaucrats that quibbled with me while our late colleague Sharice Kiwatin got sicker and sicker. I blame every cop who slapped on the cuffs. I blame Prime Minister Stephen Harper for fighting safe injection sites for a decade. And I blame Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who told us, to our face, don't hold your breath on decriminalization. You all have our dead to answer for. Thanks, everybody. Take everything you came with. See you later. Fight on. Decriminalize now. The drug war chews up families. It criminalizes new moms, jails parents, and seizes kids. For many of us, there is no parent to hold up our photo, to mourn us, 
to speak out for us. Every month we have memorials for those who have no other family, except for us. And we can't win alone. Crackdown is produced on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We're in Portugal now, presenting Crackdown at the Harm Reduction 2019 conference, and making episode 5 about Portugal's decriminalization model. You can find a link to those Do Not Prosecute letters on our website. Crackdown's editorial board is Simona Marsh, Shelda Castor, Greg Fess, Jeff Loudon, Dean Wilson, Dave Murray, Al Fowler, Laura Shaver, and Sharice Kiwaden. We miss you, Sharice. Crackdown is produced by Alexander Kim, Lisa Hale, Sam Fenn, and Gordon Caddick. This month, our lead producer was Alexander Kim. Our science advisor is Ryan McNeil, lead of the qualitative and community-based research program of the BC Center on Substance Use. Ryan is also an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. Thank you to Emily Rendell Watson and Marta Lagoki of CJSW 90.9 FM in Calgary. Light rock, less talk. I'm, I don't know. I don't know what's on that radio station. It's the, it's the campus. It's community radio. Oh, so a random assortment of things. She's my friend who like recorded Rebecca from the in the Oh, Marta did. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Oh, do we? Okay. Well, I take it back. <laughs> I'm Garth Mullins, host, writer, and executive producer. You can follow me on Twitter at Garth Mullins. Original score written and performed by Sam Fenn, Jacob Dryden, Kai Paulson, and me. Our theme song was written by Sam and I with accompaniment from Dave Jens and Ben Appenheimer. We make this podcast with funds from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. We're also supported by our listeners through Patreon. Thanks to everybody who's kicked in. Chipped in? Thanks to everybody who's kicked down. Chipped in? <laughs> chip, 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 chip. Okay, we got that, I'm sure. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Please subscribe, rate, and review. We're also on CITR and Co-op Radio in Vancouver. We're happy to be on your radio station, too. Follow us on Twitter at CrackdownPod. Our website is CrackdownPod.com. Email info at CrackdownPod.com. Patricia Fenn does our transcripts, available on our website shortly after each episode is posted. If you like what we're doing, please support us at Patreon.com slash CrackdownPod. New episodes drop on the last Wednesday of every month. Good? Cool. All right. You have been listening to a sided media production. C I D E D. Find out more at sidedmedia.ca.